Welcome to Mac and Blue, the cutting edge podcast for the nation's builders, merging the realms of construction with exciting advancements in technology. Join us on a thrilling journey where we delve into the dynamic world of blockchain, AI, the metaverse, virtual and augmented reality, and their transformative impact on the industry. Our engaging discussions span a wide spectrum, covering not only construction, economic development, supply chain, and market segments, but also exploring the vibrant tapestry of diversity within the construction landscape. We shed light on the intersection of local politics and its profound influence on the construction sector while championing the remarkable contributions of women and minorities in construction. For all things Mac and Blue, head to www.macandblue.com and don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. I'm your host, JJ Levinsky. Now let's get into it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Mac and Blue. I'm your host, JJ Levinsky, CEO and co-founder of Blue Wave. Today, we have renowned international celebrity phenom, which we'll get into it, uh, Michael Sheldrick, but he actually goes by Mick. So welcome, Mick. Um, just to give, I got to read some of this because this bio is t- too hard not to, to, to pass. <laughs> so he's the co-founder and chief policy impact and government affairs officer at Global Citizen, which we'll get into uh, how powerful and how robust Global Citizen has come on the international scene. And he's also um, out with a new book called From Ideas to Impact, which we'll highlight at the end of the podcast as well. Um, let me read it, though. A playbook for influencing and implementing change in a divided world. Um, pre-orders are available um, through all the usual uh, channels, and it should be out on Audible and all the other uh, digital formats as well. And just so you know, it's endorsed by Jane Goodall, um, other UN Goodwill ambassadors. I mean, it's a who's who's list of of who's endorsed uh, mixed books. So I'm uh, looking forward to touching that uh, touching on that during the course of our, our podcast today. So um, without further ado, welcome, Mick. And if you could, before we jump into the, the global citizen of like where you're at now, you've done enough of these. The, 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 the audience always wants to know, Mick, how did you go from here to here and give us that, that resume, that resume in under, in under 10 minutes, as far as like, uh, you know, born in Australia and, and what yeah. drove you, what, what drove you or what inspired you? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the program. It's amazing. Um, and loved, love Arizona. So <laughs> great to be on a podcast in Arizona. By the way, um, we should so- say Mick is in New York right now and I'm in Arizona. So, <laughs> you know, go ahead. exactly one extreme to the other, but where I'm from is actually probably more similar to Arizona than it is to New York. Um, so I'm from Western Australia. That's where I grew up. Um, many people think of Australia, they think Sydney, Melbourne, um, and it's very rare I meet people who have been to Perth. But, um, you know, when I went, when I was in Phoenix, um, in 2020, I, I, I think Perth and Phoenix very similar apart from the fact that Perth is, um, has all the red, um, sand and desert to one side. And then the other side, you've got the beautiful Indian ocean. So maybe it has that one advantage we, on you guys. We, we call that. <laughs> We call that San Diego, Mick. <laughs> uh, San Diego. There you go. Yeah, very similar. The, the only, the only, I guess, uh, advantage they've got on us is they're not the most isolated city in the world, which is where I grew up. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, I co-founded this organization, Global Citizen, and yet up until the age of 17 or 18, um, my first year of university when I went backpacking with my sister around the world, you know, that, that small corner of the globe was my world, right? Um, and it is isolated. Like it takes four or five hours to fly to the nearest city and there's not a lot in between. Um, and so my world growing up, you know, how did I get involved in Global Citizen? What well, really happened in high school, um, I was one of those kids who, you know, was fairly useless at many things. I certainly wasn't good at academics at the time. I remember my mom being walked out by by a teacher who made me walk the walk of shame and showed me that I was ranked bottom of the class and I wasn't going to amount to anything, let alone finish high school or get into college. Um, and I also wasn't good at sport. You know, we have, I know last night with the Super Bowl, you guys have NFL, right? Um, we have AFL in Australia. Which is, if you have any Irish listeners, it's kind of similar to Gaelic football. But I was one of those kids who, you know, would go and kick the ball. And honestly, I would be so stressed about just trying to kick the ball in the right direction, let alone score a goal, that something weird would happen and the ball would fly off in a different direction and people would laugh at me. And so, you know, I was that kid um, who, yeah, didn't really aspire to much. One of my good friends from high school said that 
when people set so long low expectations of you, you tend to live down to those expectations. Anyway, one day in, in class, um, the movie Gladiator just come out. It was about 20 years ago, my first year in high school. And we did this assignment on Roman gladiators, Roman history. And I just loved the movie. It had Russell Crowe in it. Um, and so I did this assignment, got home from school. And I remember my mum had this strange look on her face, like slightly confused. And the reason why is there was a message on, on the answer machine. Um, this was just before the days where everyone had mobile phones. And she goes, play it. And it was my teacher at the time. He was only 24 years old. I think it was his first teaching gig. And he, he was speaking to my mom. He said, hi, Mrs. Sheldrick. I've noticed a change in my call. Can you give me a call back? And the reason why my mom, because at first I was like, okay, that's a kind of strange, creepy message. Like, <laughs> what have I done wrong? But the reason why my mom had that confused look in her face, on her face, was because after years of being told Michael's lazy, stupid, isn't going to amount to much, he basically said Michael had somehow topped the class um, and topped the whole year group on this essay on Roman gladiators. And when I came in the next day, he said, I think there's more to you than meets the eye, and basically challenged me. And he said, as a result of that one test, you're now basically third for the whole semester. And I just said to him, Mr. Byrne was his name. And I said, do you think I could be number one by the end of the year? And he said, yeah, I think you can. Like, get, what have you got to lose, basically? And so I worked really hard, tried it out. And I kid you not, the last day before the end of school, um, I was outside and this car rocks up at our driveway and Mr. Byrne hops out and he goes, I was just crunching the numbers and I was driving past and didn't want to wait until tomorrow. And he outstretched his hand and he said, well done, mate. And he gave me this certificate with a number one on it. And I say that because fast forward five or so years later, I end up in the top 1% of the state. I get into law school, can study anything I want. But I never, in, my, in, in, in Australia, we have this saying, never get tickets on yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, you know, don't forget where you, where you came from. And the reason why I tell that story is I never forgot Mr. Byrne and, and the difference he made in my life. And as I got into university, you know, I was always acutely aware that, you know, there must be millions of children around the world living in abject poverty that because they don't have a great teacher like Mr. Byrne, or maybe they don't have access to, I don't know, health facilities. So they die before they even get into school. Yeah, you know, we'll never realize their potential. And so that's where I realized, you know, well, in some shape, way, or form, you know, I, I want to dedicate my life to this in some way in terms of advancing opportunity. And I didn't immediately know how to do it. I thought maybe I would study law, practice lawyer. Uh, but then I realized, well, you know, Australia has no shortage of, of lawyers. So <laughs> there's plenty of them. But what could I really do? And that's really where I fell into at university volunteering. I fundraised, did quiz nights, movie nights. We raised funds to build schools in Timor-Leste and Papua New Guinea, which is just north yep. of Australia. Um, kind of our equivalent. You've got the Caribbean, Mexico. This is, this is our equivalent. And then when, when I went to these countries and went to Timor-Leste, you know, you would be building these schools and it just occurred to me. I'm like, well, wow. how many gala night charity dinners are we going to have to do to end extreme poverty? And the truth is a lot, too many. You can't yeah, do the it. Math, and, the math became yeah. undaunting. Hey, it, Mick. Exactly. Hey, Mick, can I, and I, I don't mean to interrupt yeah. because you're on a roll. Go for it. Go for it. There, there's, there's two questions I wanted to ask that came up. One, um, I was fortunate enough to be a, a world traveler probably like you did. I ha I would grew up in a small town. And I just wanted to get out and see the world. And when I did, I was astonished at how many Aussies I met. met that that So is it in the water down there or what is it about? <laughs> uh, do they teach you like, hey, get off the island and go experience life? Because I've never met more backpackers in Europe than I did with Aussies. So true, what, yeah. what, what is it about being an Aussie that tells everyone to get out and travel and experience life? Well, I think you grow up so far away <laughs> and most, no, it's true. Like most Australians, I mean, okay. A couple of my classmates in school would go to Bali, right? That, that's reasonably right. close, which is fun. But like, it's so far away that when you go, you want to go for a reasonable chunk of time. 
And, you know, me and my sister went when I was 18, it was the first trip where we actually came to America, LA, New York. But the great thing is, is they do all these cheap tickets for Aussie students oh. where I don't, I don't know what it is now, but I think this is going back like maybe 2006, 2007, but you could get a, you could get a round the world ticket for $2,000, which included five stops. And it was only two restrictions. You had to use it, I think, within three or four months, and you could only go one way, right? Oh. So you couldn't fly to New Zealand and then come back and try yeah. going over. You had to keep going. And so our first trip, we went uh, from Perth to Auckland. We went over New Zealand, then up to LA, LA to um, New York, New York to London, and then we backpacked around Europe. We did the um, the Contiki tours, uh, the Top yep. Tech, which is those buses, and then we came back by Singapore, I think, and back into Perth. But yeah, that's why it's it's a rite of passage. I think we all well we all just, do it. Yeah. It, it. And without being patronizing, it just seems because that's so embedded in the culture. It just seems like everyone's so worldly and a little bit more culturally diverse. Would you agree? Yeah, it's it's funny. That's potentially the nicest thing I've ever heard someone say about Australians <laughs> because sometimes well, other, other, <laughs> other than you I think you don't wear any colors other than green and gold but that's okay because I'm a Packer, I'm a Packer fan yeah. so I'm a Packer fan so you're cool wearing your green and gold so <laughs> <laughs> no literally it's like I, I do remember you know there's obviously the the tropes right Steve Irwin Crocodile Dundee yeah. like there's the perception but I have to say like some of the biggest coffee snobs I've met uh, are from Melbourne and Australia. And <laughs> growing up, people used to talk about the cultural cringe, right? Whereas now people talk about the cultural creep and they talk about this great export of Australian culture oh. and, and cuisine. Like here, here in New York, it's widely known. All of the great coffee places in New York uh, are run by people from Melbourne. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Thank you for taking that tangent. Second question, before we get into what the what's the ethos behind you and your your organizations the, the other question that popped up you mentioned your mom but talk about the socioeconomic condition you grew up in were you poor rich you know in between um, broken family can, uh, regular fa you know I, I think it's going to put context to how we handle the rest of the podcast i'm i'm loving i'm loving these questions so i would i would say if i can answer that in in two dimensions um my family, probably in the context of where we grew up in Australia, writ large, we were probably in the, I would say, middle class, maybe just slightly under, um, okay. you know, middle class. Like, to put it in perspective, I'm the first generation on, on my mum's side to go into university. Um, and she grew up in a large family. She originally grew up in the UK and then met my dad, again, an Aussie backpacker. And I think in, in the UK... Yeah, the class society is so much more entrenched than it is in Australia. And I would definitely say, you know, looking at where my mum grew up um, on a farm with six other kids, you know, I, I grew up in much more privileged um, conditions and, and had that opportunity. And I think Australia gave me that opportunity in a way that she, she didn't. Um, but I have to say, when I went, where I went to school, it's on the outer suburbs of Perth, right? In the northern suburbs. Now it would be in the city because the urban sprawl has been massive. But where I grew up, you know, the school I went to was definitely, I think it was ranked near the bottom. It was a government school. So it was probably ranked at the time, like second um, of the bottom out of 50 public high schools in, in Perth, the metro area. Um, we had very um, low socioeconomic areas around us. Um, we had lots of dysfunctional families um, and broken families, as you put it. And I remember feeling the fact I had two parents, both with stable incomes. Mm. Um, I remember feeling at the time that I was very lucky um, because like I felt wealthy, um, even though we weren't by comparison to Australia as a whole, I felt wealthy as a result of where I went to school. And I think 16% of, of, of my year group or, or school were, were from, First Nations, Indigenous communities yep. as well. And in Australia, as you know, uh, or might have heard about one of our, um, you know, biggest tragedies in, in modern Australian life is just the stark inequities between, you know, those Australians of, of European descent and those of Indigenous descent. And, and I would say I, I saw those inequities 
on display um, a lot. Yeah. So then again, I, I keep deflecting and going down other before we get to the global. No, standards. no, this is great. Where, this is great. Where, 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 and what, where and how did the empathy come from then? Uh, I mean, you talked about your teacher, but maybe, maybe I can jump ahead to jump back. You know, doing my research on you, I, I, I had I'd seen you before, but then I, I think it was a you did a TEDx talk in Perth. I think what was it like five six years ago? Maybe it was even longer. And yeah. it, you, you talked about was it John or some individual that really impacted you? Um, was, was there some something between? you know, high school and university and that whole thing? Is that where that empathy really came from with you? Yeah, I, I would say, so I think you're thinking of David, David, David Goldstein. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, was, he was an older guy. Um, so I think where it probably comes from is, is twofold. I think it was certainly that recognition. Um, and I've, I've often said the reason why I do what I do is because I have this acute sense of gratitude for the opportunities I had. And I think it was definitely that awareness of the difference teachers made um, in, in my own life um, that that drove me. But I, I would say where I figured out where best to direct that, because as many people, I could have easily gone into like, I'm going to become an investment banker, make lots of money, and that's how I'm going to repay my debt to society and repay gratitude to my parents and teacher. But I think where I got into the space of social impact was you, you mentioned his name, David Goldstone. David um, was a founder of a Rotary Club in Western Australia. And Rotary Clubs, it's interesting. You might have Rotarians who listen to your show. You know, Rotary Clubs, they prop up all around the world and they do amazing work. Like they fundraise for everything from repairing local school to building schools in communities that are impoverished um, in different parts of the world. But, you know, the impression of Rotary is that they're very old, right? Like uh, they have an older demographic. Um, True. And, yeah, what well, well, David tried to do was he, he started this Rotary Club actually on campus and he would give scholarships to young people so that they could actually come along. And I was one of the recipients of those scholarships. So, you know, we would meet every Thursday, um, you know, with local business owners you know, local public servants, you know, the type of people that were members of Rotary Clubs. And it was in the course of those conversations that he said, listen, you can go and fundraise, you can do all these things and play around and raise some money, but where's the bold ideas? And he was the one that really encouraged me and said, why not, if you're going to try and make an impact, why not go all in and look at the big picture and, and can you have a much larger impact? And he was the one that really drove that. And for him, he had been a polio survivor. Um, and I tell the story in, in the TEDx talk. Um, you know, he had been someone in the 50s when he was a young man walking down the street in Sydney, suddenly collapsing, waking up in front of the chief medical officer, being told he'll never walk again, and somehow being able to prove the chief medical officer wrong, never fully recovered the use of his legs, but was able to found his own business you know, be able to raise funds that are, you know, in the hundreds of thousands. Um, and he really made a pledge that he wanted to do all he could to eradicate polio and make it just the second human disease in history to be eradicated after smallpox so that no one would have to go through what he he went through. And so I think out of homage to him and out of tribute, you know, one of the first campaigns I, I led, which would be later what ended up becoming the basis of Global Citizen, was around the eradication of polio and that sort of unfinished business. But no, he was he was a remarkable man, and unfortunately he he passed away a few years ago. But his daughter and his wife, um, he lived in Sydney and Melbourne, still very very close friends. Yeah. There comes a time when dreams become a reality, when you see your vision materialize into a true work of art, and the only way to get there is to choose a general contractor who shares that same vision and knows how to bring it to life. At Blue Wave, we aren't so big that we've forgotten where we've come from, and we aren't so small that we can't care for your projects regardless of their size. When your vision deserves safety, perfection, timeliness, and expertise in order to become a reality, trust Blue Wave to get it done right the first time.
Well, that seems like a perfect segue into, okay, now take us through the, <laughs> well, take us through your journey, well, however much you want to talk about it. If it's the early part of Global Citizen, if it's what you're doing now, um, I know we could talk for hours, so I want to be uh, time sensitive, but also give you the catalyst and the floor to talk about that. So then I can keep pinging you with these questions. So, but I, I, if you can, just for the audience sake, talk maybe to that, you know, this situation that you just got done with, how you did that first one and then what you learned and then yeah. what, prop, what propagated that to go to the global citizen. And then we, we can get into the celebrity type stuff of how you, you use that catalyst for the next level, if you don't mind. Yeah. So one of the first times I went and had coffee with David and he would meet in this nice cafe overlooking in Perth, we call it the Swan River. And it is beautiful. We have over 300 days of sunshine a year, sparkling. I, I remember it well. And I remember him and his fellow Rotarians had, had mentioned the fact that later that year, this was 2011, start of 2011, March. And they said later that year, there was a special summit that was taking place in WA. And this was significant because nothing comes to WA. Um, I'm, I try and figure out the equivalent, like maybe it's Alaska or, or somewhere, you know, that is so remote that no one wants to go there. And yet it was going to be the last trip of the Queen. Of course, we didn't know it would be her right. last trip at the time. Um, in Australia, I point this out to Americans, so many don't know this, that Australia, the, the Queen and now the King is the head of state of Australia. Um, and so it's a big deal. Right. Whenever the monarch comes to Australia, everyone comes out, everyone talks about this. And to mark her last trip to WA, all of the Commonwealth leaders, um, and again, Commonwealth to uh, Americans out there who may not know what that means. Basically, it's the association of all the former British colonies, right? right. Everywhere from South Africa to India to Canada, New Zealand, Australia. All of those pre prime ministers were going to be meeting in, in WA. So you had the Queen. You had 50 presidents and prime ministers, you know, all converging. And David kind of put it to me in the Rotarians. They said, why can't polio be the issue that these guys all commit to? And he said, listen, everyone comes out to these summits. It's a talk fest. It disrupts tra traffic. It's like what happens every year in New York when all the leaders gather for the U.N., they have a big lunch, they clap themselves on the back, they make some promises, and then they forget about it. And he said, why can't we make this the turning point to eradicate polio? Because he pointed out the fact that although polio had been reduced by 99%, it was launched in the year I was born, which was 1988. And I think at the time, there was 350,000 cases a year. And although at the time in 2011, there was just 1,000 cases, there was this huge funding gap that threatened to derail the program. And in fact, Australia hadn't funded in, in almost a decade. And he said, why don't we make this summit the turning point in this effort? So encouraged by that, Mia and some volunteers um, got together and we wrote a letter to the then Prime Minister of Australia. She was our first female Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. And I wrote it almost like as if I was writing a legal brief, right? I just wrote, dear Prime Minister, you have this moment you're hosting this gathering of world leaders in the queen the first time the queen came to australia in the 50s there was this massive outbreak of polio right this is why i think you should put it on the agenda and actually produce a concrete outcome and make this the summit to eradicate polio and contribute funding and i said also i found out that it was an australian rotarian in the 80s who had actually conceived of the idea convinced the world health organization the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, to eradicate polio and launch this endeavor. So I said, how amazing would it be if right at this um, summit with the Queen President, et cetera, Australia kind of led, led the way. And, you know, you send this letter off, and it was more to get clarity of the ask and my argument. And I always tell people, if you're wondering how to prosecute an argument, write it out, because in writing out an argument, you can, you can, you can almost – pinpoint the flaws in your argument in a way it's hard when you when you express it verbally right so sent this letter off and then i was like well let's see if we can get a response from the prime minister so at my university there was a there was a club um that was taking place a lecture by one of the local members of parliament or members of congress in in your system 
and um, she was from the same party as Prime Minister. And I was that guy at the end who just thought, I've got one of them. <laughs> kind of cornered her at the end with the letter, and I wasn't sure if she was being nice or not, but she basically committed. She said, let me, let me get this in front of the Prime Minister. The next day, I get an email from the Prime Minister's um, National Security Advisor, and he said, hi, hi Michael, we're on the plane to D.C. It was when the Prime Minister was giving an address to a joint sit-in of Congress, and he said, it sounds like a good cause. We'll be in touch when we get back. Was not expecting any kind of response. Two weeks later, um, I'm at the university cafe, and I get this phone call from a block number, um, which is, and again, you never know what those block numbers are going to turn out. Sometimes it's telemarketers. Um, 0.1%. It, of the time, it's perhaps something extraordinary. And I get this phone call, and it's from Julia Gillard, our Prime Minister's office, saying she's going to be in Perth next week. Have you got 10 minutes to sit with her and discuss the letter, right? And so I was like, absolutely. I'm not going to say no to that. Like, You're absolutely. Like, no, you know what? I'm going to check my schedule. Uh, yeah, gonna... exactly. Let me let me have a look. You know, might, might, have a pedi- seminar. might have a pedicure that day that I'm going to have to reset. It, 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 exactly. So so I was like, absolutely, I'm all in. So I, I, I rehearsed this pitch I, with my parents the night before. You know, I sat there and I was like, you know, pretend you're a prime minister, ask questions. And, of course, they were interjecting. They were asking all these hard questions. So when I got in the room, with the prime minister, the thing that was most unnerving is um, I expected her to do all the talking and to interject, but she looked me in the eye. And at first I said, I I know you're really busy. I appreciate the time. And she, I I kid you not. And she did review this in the book because I sent it to her beforehand. And so I'm cleared to say this, that I'm not making this up, but I, but she said, well, well, Michael, I'm on my third shot of Red Bull for the evening. So if you don't mind, Let's get on with it. Like, make your pitch, basically. So, uh, so I launched into it, and she looked at me the whole time, didn't interject once, um, but I could tell she was intently focused, and it was, and I had her full attention, um, which I've always remembered when I meet with people now, people ask for advice, is it doesn't matter who they are, good ideas can come from a- anywhere, and to always give people the respect of, of listening to them regardless of who they are. Um, so I've never forgotten how she, how she treated me in that moment. And at the end of the pitch, you know, there I am, like, you know, trying to get my breath, um, cause I've spoken really fast and she just goes, I really like this idea and I think it has merit, but I need some help. And I'm thinking, you're the prime minister. You're the most powerful yeah. person in the country. What do you mean you need help? And I guess it makes sense because we tend to think of politicians of being able to click their fingers and do anything but yeah what she was really saying was you know at the end of the day i need permission to spend what is in the end your money right Right. like taxpayers money and so i don't know where the idea came from like music i was just thinking how do we provide a platform to show young people care about this but i just said what about a concert we would do a concert the night before um we would get all these young people together We would show that everyone cares about this. You would have this big public stage and you could make this announcement. And she said, well, if you can do that, we've we've got a deal, Um, which is great. Until I walked out there and realized I had never organized anything like that in my life. (laughs) Like the best I had done is in Australia, we call a barbecue a sausage sizzle. So you just put some sausages on. Kendall, remember that one, a sausage. (laughs) (laughs) You, You put it in a literally a slice of bread some yeah. barbecue sauce, brown sauce, and, and away you go. I had done one of them, and it hadn't gone well. Like, the barbecues were frozen. People, everyone that came on campus quickly walked off. <laughs> so I, I was like, fortunately, and, and this is where I talk about in the book the power of um, a friend of mine, Ari Obinson, who's um, heads up a, a, a nonprofit in St. Louis. He talks about the power of naively audacious goals, and he says sometimes if you have – bold goals, even if you don't have the experience or the networks, if you are clear and precise in how you can create the impact, in this case, the prime minister is going to get these leaders, they're going to contribute to polio, we're going to help eradicate this disease, right? People will come out of the woodwork to support you. 
And I kid you not, over that course of six months, and that could have been a book in and of itself, I, I remember sitting on a bench at my university and I got a phone call from this producer who had just met an Australian um, surfing, I think in Hawaii. They'd gotten married and she'd moved to Queensland. And it turns out she was a music producer from Utah. She knew MTV. She knew Sun the Redstone from Viacom. And she basically committed to help us. And she had other offers. And I still remember her saying, do you even have enough money to pay me? <laughs> and I was like kind of fudging my way through. And she was like, I take that as a no. And she was like, what team have you got? She saw through everything, but right. she gave me a call and she goes, do you think this is going to happen? And I said, yeah, I think if we deliver, the prime minister will keep her word. And she goes, okay, I'll help you. Her name was Lindsay Hadley. And um, she helped us secure with our team um, and others. Um, and my other co-founder, Hugh, who at that point was in New York, um, we managed to convince John Legend to agree to fly all the way to Perth, Australia. Um, he spent more time flying there and back than he was there on the ground. Um, but I can tell you it had such a huge effect. And then there was a guy who contacted me from California, Ryan Gould, and it was his idea to basically say, instead of charging people for tickets, get people to take an action like signing in a petition in signing a petition, they go into the draw in a lottery to earn a ticket. So we had 25,000 people take an action for 5,000 tickets. Um, and I kid you not, the, the day after this event, this amazing concert, the prime minister called a press conference. We had all these Rotarians, David, who had been this polio survivor, um, who's still to that day um, carried a limp whenever he walked. He was sat front row. And the prime minister announced collectively with the other leaders $118 million um, to eradicate polio. And I had no idea what would happen after that. To be honest, I was still had a year left of law school. I thought maybe I'd go back. Um, but short end is nine months after that, we were standing on the great lawn of Central Park for what was the first global citizen festival where we had 60,000 people in attendance. And we had, um, I think, Neil Young, the Foo Fighters, some of the biggest artists in the world. We had this app. And since then, you know, we're now into it. We, we skipped 2020, um, but every other year we've had that every September. And it's now a movement worldwide, which has generated over 30 million citizen actions and generated um, with our amazing partners over $40 billion worth of commitments. Um, that's helped many organizations impact the lives in some way that our team estimates um, over a billion people have been touched in some way through the commitments generated. And um, yeah, the, the, rest is, the rest is history, as they said. <laughs> well, not, uh, hey, that's an unbelievable story. Almost too good to be true, but congratulations. Uh, boy, I don't even know where, well, I have a million questions. <laughs> First and foremost, let's talk about that secret sauce or your recipe, which was the, instead of raising money, you're initiating action. How has that formula changed and morphed over the years, uh, Mick? And, and, and how, for, for the person listening or watching, what does that mean? Like, can you give some uh, more candid um, examples of, of how that, how that impacts so much more than just a dollar given. Yeah, yeah. You know, when, when I was pitched on the idea by, by Ryan, uh, this, this um, social entrepreneur, I guess he describes himself from California, he called it gamified activism, right? So the idea was, you know, rather than, as, as he said, you know, you, you could raise a few million dollars quite easily from running a concert, but if so many of these issues right now are systemic in nature, right? Poverty, you know, I think the last estimates I saw is going to cost at least $100 billion a year in additional funding to eradicate poverty in the world, right? You know, if, if these issues are structural, they, they require systemic solutions. And so to do that, like we've seen in the civil rights movement, like we saw in apartheid, you know, all of the big... Um, moments in history where where these 
crisis and issues have been overcome, often at, at the, the, the front of this change is social movements, right? And so the idea was, is could you use tickets almost as an entry point to get people involved in the movement to, to end extreme poverty? And it, it was also based on the recognition that, you know, often in the nonprofit sector, and I work on issues where it's sanitation, hunger, um, access to water, you know, there's always this assumption from people I, I meet with that um, everyone is talking about these issues all the time. Everyone is talking about these issues around the dinner table. But the reality is, is, is they're not because people have their own issues. They have their own problems. But one thing people all love is culture, right? And they love entertainment and they love music. Might not all love the same types of music, but you can find an aspect of popular culture that can, can be unifying. And so I think the model was, okay, well, let's tap into that and use that as a way to mainstream these issues and then give people a platform um, to take to take action. Um, and hopefully in doing so, not only will it give people a way to get involved, learn more, but to actually have a far bigger outsized impact than raising a few million dollars. And I'm not discounting that. Like generosity and charitable donations definitely has it has its place. But if we really want to address extreme poverty, if we want to provide universal access to water, to sanitation, we also need a, we also need a step change as well. And so today, you know, this movement's really become 365 days a year. And what we see now, we have over 12 million citizen advocates around the world. What we really see is that the rewards whether that's tickets to our festival, other types of rewards, and we've partnered with other musicians, other concerts, other events, you know, around the world. So it's not just our own activities. But what we're seeing is, yes, people love being rewarded for their activism and advocacy and their vo and volunteering. But what we also see is people continue to stay engaged in the platform year in, year out. Um, taking action on the issues, learning about these issues. And it's been incredible because this now takes place not just in New York, but across different parts of Africa. For instance, in 2022, I spent a lot of time in Ghana um, where we had this huge event to mark um, um, what, what was the 65th anniversary of Ghanaian independence. And what was amazing there is we gave away tickets in response to people volunteering for beach cleanups. So out on the beach, there's extraordinary amounts of plastic litter. And we had the mayor down, we had people out and people were, were you know, picking up bags of, of trash in exchange for tickets. But in doing so, it also put pressure on the government to say, well, what's the structural issue? Because there's so much plastic here. How are we going to address this as well? And so it's definitely, it's definitely become global. And in the last few years, we've really scaled up our presence in Africa, mainly because Africa is full of so many young people. It's where culture and music um, collide and people are just thirsty um, for this, for this model. But I, I, I think a great example, you know, just you, you asked me for what was, what was a good example of, of, of impact. You know, I would say in, in 2021, um, we were contacted by these nonprofits um, and indigenous groups in the Amazon. And w that year we had Coldplay performing um, at the Global Citizen Festival in Central Park. And Chris Martin has been the curator of the Global Citizen Festival since 2015. And Coldplay are massive in Brazil. I mean, they're massive around the world, but in Brazil they can perform day in, day out, and, and people love them. And this nonprofit group of indigenous activists said, listen, we've written to all the governors in the Amazon and we're asking them to protect our area, right, from illegal deforestation. And we haven't had much of a response. And they said, can, can Coldplay and global citizens use their voice, right, and almost uh, tweet out these governors. It was called Twitter at the time before X. And they said, put the spotlight on these governors and say, hey, why aren't you responding to this letter? Will you stand up? And so the reason why I like that example is it wasn't Coldplay coming in as, you know, the Messiah, we're going to change everything. They were actually lifting up the voices of, of local advocates along with the actions of millions of citizens around the world. 
And the short end of that is one of the governors from the state of Pará actually responded and came to the Global Citizen Festival and made a commitment which we've tracked. And basically, it was the only area under Bolsonaro when he was president that was protected from the Amazon. And I think we calculated it was a, a land size equivalent to the size of Rhode Island that was protected from illegal deforestation as as a result um, of of that effort. And so that's that's just one one example um, of of impact of where you've got popular culture advocacy coming together um, to create change. Phenomenal. There comes a time when dreams become a reality, when you see your vision materialize into a true work of art. And the only way to get there is to choose a general contractor who shares that same vision and knows how to bring it to life. At Blue Wave, we aren't so big that we've forgotten where we've come from, and we aren't so small that we can't care for your projects regardless of their size. When your vision deserves safety, perfection, timeliness, and expertise in order to become a reality, trust Blue Wave to get it done right the first time. And by the way, great story. So as you were talking, I was trying to think of, I'm trying to think of the, the people that argue against you, Mick. And yeah. I'm, I'm trying to put a, a, a scenario together where I can challenge you so you can kind of respond to me. Much like, come on, put your lawyer hat on. You're the smart guy. <laughs> I'm just the construction guy. But I, I think of it as let's take the taxpayer dollar, right? Yeah. yeah. Because one of the things that in, in going into this podcast, I was like, okay, and you, whether you know this or not, you've kind of answered it, but I want to be, I want to articulate it even in a more clear fashion for the audience is, okay, Mick, let's say, you know, a government or, or something has X, you know, let's say use a million dollars to apply towards a program. What you're saying is, I think what Global Citizen, what you found out is you've cracked the code of a million is only a million, but if we can effectuate change based on the million, if we can use the million dollars as a repository or deposit, kind of like something that's going to accrue interest, and we can move the needle so that the citizens actually are the advocacy and the action takers versus the government, we've actually doubled down on our investment. Is that a good way of describing it? I, I love what you're describing there. You know, in the book, I talk about the power of leverage, right? And <laughs> Look I, at Look at leverage right there. <laughs> there it is. There it Le is. That, leverage. That's the word, that's the word we're, we're looking for. It's it's good for it's a good building construction term, right? Um, and I and I often find many nonprofits, even businesses, to be honest, and and even foundations like foundations that grant away millions of dollars, right? I often find when I speak to them, I'm like, listen, you know, what is your strength here? Why are you re trying to recreate the wheel, right? Why is a foundation investing in all this stuff, building out all of, all of these institutions, when the reality is, is, as you put it, if they invest that million dollars in terms of citizen advocacy, you know, people that already exist, they could potentially have a 5, 10x re social return on that investment, right? And what I see around the world right now when it comes to policy change, um, which is the work I'm in, where it's like, okay, the idea that by shifting government budgets, by investing in policy change, we can have an outsized impact on, on the world around us. Often what I see is a tendency in, in the world of foundations and philanthropy. They understand that they want to influence policy agendas, but they will often try building out their own networks, right? They're higher lobbyists. They were higher, um, they were higher a research staff. And yet, you know, in many parts of the world, including here in America, there's these amazing grassroots organizations, citizen advocates who already have relationships because advocacy and activism is about relationships of, of trust. They already have the know-how. They just don't have the investment. And so, you know, one of the big points I make in the book is if, 
foundations want to find their leverage point, if they want to have a transformative impact, the most efficient thing they can do is actually team up and partner with many of these these organizations mm -hmm. rather than trying to recreate the wheel. And I see the same in, in, in nonprofits, businesses, too much investment goes into, yeah, I think it comes from a desire to control things, right? People yeah. want to control things and partnership. You do have to, you do have to be willing to let go a little bit, but if you did, you could have a huge, huge impact. So for me, it, it's, it's, it's all about leverage. And I think it's one of the reasons why, you know, people are often surprised at global citizens because they see us doing all of this stuff and then they come into our office and they're like, where, where is everyone? <laughs> And when I tell people our stuff globally for everything we're doing, it's, yeah, it's, it's it's less than 100 people. Like in Brazil, I'm teaming up with this great production company to hopefully do something later this year in, in Brazil. Why, why recreate the wheel? All right, next question. The You've used music and the culture as your vehicle, if you will, your platform, your connectivity. What have you guys, where are you challenged with the next generation? And where I'm going with is, uh, you know, the, you talked about the gaming approach. Do you, are you constantly being challenged of how do you connect with the next generation? Because they're virtual, they're, you know, they're communicating through their avatars and all those kind of things. Have you approached the, the, those different media channels or are you struggling to break through on that connectivity as well? Yeah, I think, I think this is where, if leverage was, was the last word we, we honed in on, I think this is where entrepreneurship comes, um, comes into, is, is, is key, right? Um, and what I really say, the reason why I talk about the idea of entrepreneurship in a policy context is, you know, a good policy entrepreneur should always be trying to find disruptive me um, methods and yeah. unconventional methods to break through, right? especially as, you know, to influence policy agendas, you're often going up with well-resourced lobbyists, you know, the types of lobbyists that can pay $10,000, if not more, for a seat at a table with a member of Congress. Um, and so if you don't have those budgets, you know, you've got to find other ways um, to demonstrate power so you can have legitimacy and credibility and that people will want to meet with you. And the way to do that is to have a strong audience to basically say, I represent this constituency here. And to your point, given, you know, how diversified media landscapes come, social media, you know, we've got to go to where people are in order to get them engaged in our issues. And so, you know, I think experimenting around right now with gaming, experimenting around with different forms of culture, it's one of the reasons why at a global citizen festival, you will never see um, every singer from the same genre, right? Like last year, you know, we, we bring together everyone like the likes of Metallica, Mariah Carey, K-pop, John Cook. That's a, hell, know, of a it, that's a hell of a duet there. <laughs> to, 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 red, to Red Hot Chili Peppers, right? Yeah. And I think it's like you, you, have, to, you have to do that um, if you're to reach people, otherwise you, you lose your relevance. And when you lose your relevance, you lose your credibility. Um, you know, truth is last year, Global Citizen actually had a record breaking year in terms of the actions in terms of our New York festival. Um, you know, partly that was because we had Jungkook from BTS and from K-pop and that, you know, the, the, the t amount of actions I drove, yeah, was, was insane. But it was also because I think, you know, our team, continuous experiments with different forms of, you know, um, platforms, you know, how do you reach people, different forms of communities, um, and how do you tap into those communities in, in, in a, an authentic way, um, to get, to get people engaged. And yeah. yeah, I would, I would say part of our work in, in Africa right now has been recognizing long term, apparently 2015, maybe it's 20, 2100, right? A quarter of the world's population will be will be African. Um, this will be the largest consumer market in the world. The young people will be those driving everything. And so I think our big bet now is this is where companies, governments will all want to influence in 10, 15 years, you know, but they're not willing to invest right now. And I think that's where our strategy is, is to already harness that power of young people. And what I've seen is this huge gratitude 
because through partnering with us, they have this almost megaphone, this platform to tell leaders what they want and they want energy access, they want education, they want skills. Um, so yeah, in, in short to answer your question, I think that's constantly um, the challenge that we are constantly having to innovate and, and challenge ourselves on. But there are risks as well, right? And one of the, you mentioned it before, we live in this era of division and polarization. And I would say in, in sometimes in trying to speak to our audiences, we can adopt um, what I would say is unhealthy habits where rather trying to bridge gaps, we actually end up amplifying um, the gaps between people, right? And, you know, I think I, in the book, I talk about the purity test and the danger of the purity test where right now there's this unhealthy habit in many parts of the world where the people we engage with, the policies we promote, you know, any form of engagement we subject to this purity test. And if it doesn't ladder up to our version of what is pure, what is right, we basically are told to turn away and not pursue that engagement because otherwise we will be accused of betrayal, of treachery, et cetera, by our, by our own tribe. And that, that tribalism, if we, if we feed into that, that then, then we will no longer be having an impact. We'll be pursuing ideology over mm. impact. Um, and so for us, it's always, well, what, what do we really want to do? Do we want to raise awareness or do we want to change people's lives for the better? So it does right. go either way, but I would say you've got to, you've got to meet people where they're at, but not in a way in which you, um, you know, you wholesale throughout your, your principles. Yeah. Great. I'm going to switch. Um, I was looking at the clock. I just want to be conscientious of time. So I'm going to go down a couple other uh, rabbit holes with you, Mick, as far as some of the things that we did on the pre-work. And if you can just chime in, one of them was, um, uh, could you reference what the eight step playbook to being a policy entrepreneur means to the average person? And uh, like, what is it? Is it something you came up with? I assume it's in your book, but g give us kind of the context around it. Yeah, I mean, I've spoken about it a few times, right? This concept of entrepreneurship, um, which basically my point is, is listen, um, there are many ways to make a difference. You can fundraise, you can register to vote, but we all have a stake in the policies that shape our lives. Policies can seem abstract. They can seem vague, um, but they're fundamentally about people and the people who implement them. And so the book is really... It's really a how-to guide and it maps out these eight principles and it's a, and it basically says whether you're an everyday, um, citizen or you're the leader of a nonprofit or you're in philanthropy, right? Here are eight principles on how you can begin to influence change, um, in public policy. And I don't profess to have all of the answers, but it is a, it is a start and that's what it's meant to provide. It's meant to provide people with a start. And one thing that I believe is if we, if we all made a start and we share that with people in our circles of trust, that's probably one of the most powerful things we can do to motivate people and give people hope and push back against some of the disillusionment and sense of powerlessness that is too often in display. And, um, you know, I, I start the book by listing one of the quotes from um, Eleanor Roosevelt, former U.S. First Lady, and I have this quote on, on a magnet on my fridge, but she once said allegedly that, the the way to begin is to begin and so yeah. the book in that in that sense is a is a way to begin and i hope it will be accessible to to many people yeah well there that was our pitch for your book everyone go out and buy it right now <laughs> get inspired hey mick what what's the um talk about the coal miners in wa and and what or i don't know if you have, we have enough time but what does that what's the story mean to you and, and how can the audience draw upon that Okay, so I'll tell this very brief story at, at the start, and then if people want the, um, the the part in the middle, they can go out and buy the book and, and read okay. it. But but essentially, you know, I, I I was looking for issues of polarization in communities and divisions, and then I was looking at for interesting examples of where people had come together to advance an issue, right? And I think this would be relevant to many coal communities in America, in in West Virginia. Um, and other parts of the country. 
But, you know, one of the things I often find in the context of um, activism around climate change is there often isn't an appreciation for the workers impacted, right? You're saying we need to cut down, um, shut down coal power plants um, to mitigate climate change. But what about those workers who not just live economic livelihoods, but their whole identity, you know, in, in this town in Western Australia where I, where I interviewed many of the representatives from, you know, some of the people I met with were three, four, you know, generation miners or power plant workers, right? It's, it's literally in their DNA. And so what does that look like when we say, okay, we've got to shift away from coal? And the thing that was unique about this community in Western Australia is it was actually the workers and the trade unionists who led the process themselves, um, which is different to other parts of the world where often trade unionists are the ones saying, no, don't close down this mine or don't close down this plant because we're going to be left out with any jobs. And a story I like to tell is the, the leader of this particular trade union, you know, he, he's this big guy. His name is Steve. Um, he's very, very rough. They tell you directly to your face what he thinks. So I'm interviewing him for the book, and he tells me a story how in 2007, when Inconvenient Truth had come out from Al Gore, he was like, I see where this is all going. I know what's going to happen. Coal has no future. So he goes to his town. There's this town hall convening, and he tells them, he goes, we have to start planning for life without coal. And all of a sudden, like, the room is silent, and then this one worker gets up, and he goes, Steve, you don't understand this town. Let me tell you two things. When a baby boy is born, he gets two things. The first is he gets his mother's milk. The second thing is he gets a lump of coal in his, in his hand, right? Get out of here, basically. And Steve described to me how when he walked out of this town hall, he goes, everyone applauded this guy. And he goes, that's why I realized I lost the audience. He walks out and it was like, you know, when there's fish pardon, but yeah. no one wanted to be near him. He goes, suddenly five years later, when the government started saying, ah, oh, maybe coal's not economical, the town called him back and he said, suddenly there I was like being treated like I was Notre Dame or something. And, and so comes back in um, and they lead this process. And the short end of it, a uh, flip to the end, is in 2022, um, you know, the, the premier of the state or the governor, as you say in America, goes out to this community and he announces um, that the coal plants, the two remaining, will be shut in the next few years. And there's silence. And then all of a sudden, Steve's standing at the back. He said, he'll never forget this day. Suddenly, one person starts to clap, and the whole room uh, breaks out in applause. And the reason for that is, coupled with the closure of those plants, was the news that one of the largest batteries in the southern hemisphere will be coming to that plant. It will create hundreds of jobs um, and investment. And so the book goes into depth on how that took place, how you went from workers rejecting this to embracing this change and how they were able to secure a future for their town and perhaps what the takeaways are for, um, you know, do, doing similar efforts in, in other towns across across the world and yeah i'll give you a hint they didn't go to austin and meet elon musk and convince him to give him a battery although they did think of that at first and they realized they were easier means yeah they just they needed you to make a connection right <laughs> um it, all right in the short time we have left mick what uh, I, I wouldn't be doing my job if i didn't ask well i really want to talk about whiskey but we're going to run out of time um, by the way what's your favorite rye bourbon or single malt you know what I I thought I had um so I, I don't have it on me but I I actually have a, one of my favorite whiskies is from Arizona it's a I think it's um Dalback um yep. and yeah my wife and I in 2020 we were road tripping and we went to Tucson and we found it in one of the whiskey houses there but um you know I would say my my granddad was Scott 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 from Scotland so uh -oh. Scotch yeah. naturally you know, I would be betraying my heritage if I didn't say scotch, but I would say definitely um, rye in particular, those vanilla notes have, have um, been something I've become a lot more interested in. So, but yeah, I love, I love whiskey. I love the story behind it. And I think honestly, 
you can get people around a table with a dram, you know, oh, yeah. we would probably solve half the world's problems. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's that's your next global citizen movement, right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Whis- whiskey, whiskey as the commodity that 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 ties everyone together. Okay, final question before we depart. What is it, Mick? What is your what is your outlook? What is your future? What is your goal? Let's say the next couple of years for for global citizen. Um, first of all, I hope the book will be a great success. So um, my goal is to um, use that as a platform to see if we can get many everyday citizens. And I'm hoping, you know, to be encouraged by the stories of impact um, that people will have in their own communities. So that's really one piece that I want to see. I think the second piece is I mentioned our work in Africa with Global Citizen. You know, by the end of this year, we really want to be in three cities. We were in one city last year next year in five cities um, and really have that scaled up. But honestly, the the proof in the pudding will be if other groups replicate what we do. And, you know, if we create, you know, Africa's first music tour, but if others, like I mentioned Brazil um, before, if other other huge artists are touring through there, you know, within the next 10 years, I think that would be amazing. I mean, you take a country like Nigeria, which is dependent on oil revenues, there's no reason why, you know, they could not have a huge amount of their economy coming from creative industries, entertainment. I mean, they've got so many talented young people. So I think I think that would be pretty, pretty exciting. Yeah. Well, with that, I'm going to do my final plug for you and then we'll sign off. So thanks again. And for everyone that's, that's watching, wants more information, uh, Mick's book, remember his formal name is Michael Sheldrick. And the book, again, is from Ideas to Impact, and it's out there right now for pre-order, and all the rest of it will be available, I'm sure, very shortly. I also encourage you to look him up on um, any kind of social media platform and look at some of the work he's done. We referenced the TEDx talk. Um, If you're interested in all, take a look at that. That was a nice one. Um, I actually, uh, Mick, without patronizing you, I thought the interview that you did in Ghana was also very um, informative. So I, I think anyone that's watching this would, would like that. It wasn't a long video to watch. And I thought it offered tremendous insight into what you guys are doing in Africa. And I, I think people can transcend that, that, that image and that message and see where it's, where it's going to. So thank you again for being on today. Good luck in your cause and, uh, see if you can break Central Park, you know, bust <laughs> open, bust open those barriers. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. You've been listening to the Mac and Blue Show, brought to you by Blue Wave General Contracting. Be sure to subscribe to the Mac and Blue podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Follow JJ Levensky on LinkedIn and Instagram. Tune in every Monday 